Hello, and welcome back to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. My name is Rebecca Larson, and I am owner of TudorsDynasty.com. Today's episode is episode two, The King and His Early Victories. At the end of our last podcast, we ended with the death of Henry, Duke of Cornwall, at 52 days old, and how it took five more years for Henry and Catherine to have a surviving daughter, Princess Mary. Today, we step back a bit and look at the beginning of Henry VIII's reign, his marriage to Catherine, and other noteworthy events of the time. The year is 1509. King Henry VII had just died at Richmond Palace, surrounded by his most intimate courtiers, a few members of his household, and his son, Henry. It is believed that his death was kept secret for two days, which would bring us to April 23, 1509. The new king, Henry VIII, was merely 18 years old and well aware of the state of the English people after many years of heavy taxation under his father's rule. Henry saw his father's men, Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley, as the men responsible for the state of the people. Who were Empson and Dudley, you ask? Richard Empson was educated as a lawyer and a minister for Henry VII, and Edmund Dudley, who was the grandfather of Robert Dudley, future Earl of Leicester, was an administrator and financial agent. Empson quickly became unpopular for being one of Henry VII's fall guys, for making his kingdom wealthy and his subjects destitute. Empson was defended by King Henry VII. He was not, however, protected by his son, King Henry VIII. At the beginning of his reign, only two days after the death of his father and predecessor, Henry decided to show his subjects that his reign would be different from his father's. His first step was to arrest his father's notoriously unpopular taxmen, Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley. The accusations against Empson and Dudley were as follows. 1. That they had committed many people to prison without suffering them to answer till they had paid their fines. 2. For searching unduly men's estates and bringing them wrongfully to hold under that tenure by which land was held immediately of the crown. Without that, the parties could be permitted to a traverse till they had paid great fines and ransoms. 3. That wards being held come to full years were not allowed to sue out their livery till they had paid an excessive composition. 4. That outlawed persons could not be allowed to sue out their charter of pardon till they had paid half the profit of their lands for two years upon pretense that it was according to law. 5 that he usurped upon jurisdiction of other courts in hearing and determining divers' matters properly belonging to them. 6. That whereas a prisoner being indicted for theft in the city of Coventry, to the value of one pound, was by the jury acquitted. The said Empson, conceiving the evidence sufficient, committed the jury to prison until they entered into bond to appear before the king's council, where the matter, being again considered, it was ordered they should pay eight pounds for the fine. How many of these allegations were confirmed? Were they merely fabricated because the king was looking to gain favor by his subjects? Let's be honest, Empson and Dudley were greatly unliked by the English subjects, but that does not make it okay to trump up charges on someone and execute them. On April 23, 1509, Empson and Dudley were committed to the Tower of London. Once placed there, more strange crimes were put against them. They were accused of conspiracy against the king and state. First, that during the sickness of Henry VII in March 1509, they had summoned some of their friends to be in the area at an hour's warning, and upon the death of Henry VII to hasten to London. It was delivered to the jury that their intent was to seize the new king, Henry VIII, and take control of government for themselves. And if that did not work, then to kill the new king. Dudley was convicted of treason on July 18, 1509, in Empson, in October of the same year. On August 18, 1510, on Tower Hill, Edmund Dudley and Richard Empson were executed. If his first actions are any indication of his rule, his subjects should have known that much more blood would shed before his death in 1547, which included two of his wives. Moving on to the following year. In 1511, Queen Catherine still had a strong loyalty to her father, Ferdinand of Aragon. The fact that she had the king's ear 
and was convincing the war-hungry Henry to help her father was a sore spot with some. In November of 1511, the plotting of Catherine and her father came to fruition when Henry agreed to sign the Treaty of Westminster. Henry and Ferdinand pledged to help each other against their mutual enemy, France. In 1512, Henry VIII sent an army into France, but they failed miserably. Catherine convinced her husband to mount another attack upon France in 1513. The king led this attack himself instead of putting his trust into one of his men. Ferdinand of Aragon was also mounting an offense against France at the same time. The Venetian ambassador is quoted as saying, The king is bent on war. The council is averse to it. The queen will have it, and the wisest counselors of England cannot stand against the queen. That statement says a lot about the power of persuasion Catherine had over her husband, the king. In June 1513, King Henry, along with the pregnant Queen Catherine by his side, rode from London to Dover at the head of 11,000 men. At Dover Castle, Henry officially named Catherine regent upon his departure. He had commanded the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Warham, and the elderly, 70-year-old, Thomas Howard, Earl of Surrey, as her advisors. The king had requested that the Earl of Surrey escort Catherine back to London. Catherine was very distraught for Henry's safety when she bid him farewell at Dover, but Surrey was able to comfort her on their way back to London and calm her nerves. By late July in 1513, Catherine, the regent, was informed at Richmond Palace that the Scots were planning an attack on England and were beginning to mobilize their troops. Scotland and King James IV were allies with France. They were aware that the king was in France at the time and probably assumed that they could easily defeat an English army while the king was absent from his throne. They clearly did not understand the power and intelligence of Catherine, who was the daughter of the formidable Catholic monarchs Isabel and Ferdinand. On the 22nd of August in 1513, the Scottish king had an army of 80,000 men strong that crossed the border into England. They advanced into Northumberland, at the same time the Scots entered England, Surrey was heading north with his troops to meet them. While Henry was away dominating the French, Catherine had to defend England when King James IV took the opportunity to invade on behalf of his ally, France. When James IV crossed the border into England, the Queen rallied 40,000 soldiers and emulated her mother, Isabel. Catherine urged the troops to defend their country and to Remember that the Lord smiled upon those who stood in defense of their own. Remember that the English courage excels that of all other nations upon earth. In early September, Catherine traveled north to Buckingham, where she awaited news from Surrey. While waiting, she made a speech to the reserve troops who were camped outside the town. She urged them to victory for England's just cause against the Scots. However, the reserve troops would not need to fight because word would soon arrive of Surrey's victory at Flodden on September 9, 1513. It turned out to be one of the bloodiest battles in British history. 10,000 Scots lay dead on the moor, and among them was their king, James IV. Surrey sent the queen, the Scottish king's banner, and the bloody coat he had died in as their trophies. Catherine, in turn, sent them to Henry as proof of their victory. Along with the trophies, she sent a letter to Henry, here are a few snippets from that letter. In this, your grace, shall see how I keep my promise, sending you for your banners a king's coat. I thought to send himself unto you, but our Englishman's heart would not suffer it. It should have been better for him to have been in peace than have this reward. My lord of Surrey, my Henry, would fain know your pleasure in burying the king of Scots' body, for he has written to me so. With the next messenger, your grace's pleasure, may be herein known. And with this I make an end, praying God to send you home shortly, for without there is no joy here can be accomplished. And for the same I pray, and now go to Our Lady of Walsingham, that I promised so long ago to see, at Woburn, the 16th of September, your humble wife and true servant, Catherine. Catherine's involvement in the Battle of Flodden had exhausted her so much that she worried she might miscarry the child. While she never made it to the battlefield, she is said to have traveled as far as Buckingham. Nonetheless, the preparation and everyday rigor of planning the war had taken the toll on her body and unborn child. 
On the 8th of October, prior to Henry's return to England, Catherine delivered a premature son. He died shortly after birth. It is sad to see such a victory in battle became a defeat in producing an heir for the king. 1514 was a big year for King Henry's favorite sister, Princess Mary. The king had arranged for Mary to wed the King of France. As always, it was a political alliance for England. To have France as an ally instead of an enemy was definitely a benefit to the country after years of fighting. This letter is written by a Venetian merchant in England who wrote it to his brothers. The letter included this about Princess Mary's departure, where she was to become queen. London, September 23rd, 1514. Entertainment banquets and jousts are being held for the departure of the queen, who left for Dover four days ago, accompanied by four of the chief lords of England, namely the treasurer, the lord chaplain, the chancellor, and lord Stanley, besides 400 knights and barons and 200 gentlemen and other squires with their horses. The lords, knights, and barons were all accompanied by their wives, attended by their damsels. There would be about 1,000 palfreys and 100 women's carriages. There are so many gowns of woven gold and with gold grounds, housing for the palfreys and horses of the same materials and chains and jewels that they are worth a vast amount of treasure. And some of the noblemen in the company to do themselves honor, had spent as much as 200,000 crowns each. Many of the merchants proposed going to Dover to see this fine sight, and about a week ago all the merchants of every nation went to court. The Queen of France, Princess Mary, desired to see them all and gave her hand to each of them. She wore a gown in the French fashion of woven gold, very costly. She is very beautiful and has not her match in all England is a young woman of 16 years old, tall, fair, and of light complexion, with a color and a most affable and graceful. On her neck was a jeweled diamond, as large and as broad as a full-sized finger, with a pear-shaped pearl beneath it, the size of a pigeon's egg, which jewel had been sent her as a present by the King of France and the jewels of the Roe, whom the King desired to value it, estimated its worth at 60,000 crowns. It was marvelous that the existence of this diamond and pearl should never have been known. It is believed that they had belonged to the late King of France or to the Duke of Brittany, the father of the late Queen. According to the report of the courtiers, the Queen was to cross over to Boulogne and the King of France would come as far as Abbeville. It was said to meet her and there consummate their marriage with this nymph from heaven, her beauty and affability warranting the expression. On bidding farewell to the merchants, she made them all many offers, speaking a few words in French and delighting everybody. The whole court now speaks both French and English, as in the time of the late king. Mary was in the care of Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, on her trip, and on the 2nd of October, they launched for France. Her voyage was not without problems, a very strong wind picked up merely an hour after they launched. This scattered all the ships in their fleet in several directions. One of the ships, called the Great Elizabeth, succumbed to the weather and sunk with a loss of 400 men. Mary's own ship ran ashore near the entrance to Boulogne Harbor. Sir Christopher Garneys, an ambassador to King Louis XII, ran through the breakers and carried the soaked and frigid Mary to safety. Thank you so much for joining me today as we make this journey through the reign of King Henry VIII. In our next episode, we will continue with Mary's time in France as Queen up to the year 1522 in the English court.